Right now, more than a year later, officers make a pair of arrests in a mysterious death investigation in Iowa County. And hundreds of people attend a rally today outside of the state capitol. What brought everyone out straight ahead? Plus, despite a battle with Mother Nature, the Janesville Grand Prix has returned for the second straight year. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now at 6. And thanks for joining us tonight. It has been more than a year since the death of 13 year old Sayla Caden in Iowa County. Now two women have been charged in her death and we're learning more about what could have caused it. Our Amanda Quintana is here now with those details. Amanda. Yes, well, Lori Berry and her daughter Alexis were caring for Sayla last summer. The criminal complaint says they were family friends of Sayla's parents who moved from Madison to North Carolina eight years ago. And when Sayla needed long term psychiatric care, they turned to the Berries. Berries are devastated. Uh, they're they're completely and, and totally devastated that, uh, that there are charges. They love this girl very much. Attorney Brian Brophy is representing Lori and Alexis Berry, the mother and daughter facing first degree reckless homicide charges for the death of 13 year old Sayla Caden. It happened here at their home off Miller Road in Mineral Point. Sayla's parents sent her to stay with the Berries for the summer after they say she's starting having behavioral and emotional problems. Lori Berry told investigators once here it got worse and Sayla would throw herself on the floor and pretend to faint causing bruises. The day she died, the berries say she did it again and hit her head hard. They thought she was pretending to be unconscious. I think that this would be an extraordinarily tough case to decide to charge if you were a prosecutor. The autopsy telling a very different story. The forensic pathologist finding Sayla died from smothering and suffocation, blunt force patterned beating. There was no lethal trauma to the head and her injuries didn't seem like she did them to herself. He believes more than one person caused her death and there was a delay in reporting that death. When you say that the autopsy shows something, no, somebody's opinion uh, shows something. Uh, and, uh, you know, it remains to be seen whether that opinion is even borderline valid. Brophy couldn't say much about the evidence, but says you can't take a criminal complaint as fact when the real question is, what happened to Sayla? This is a hard case, and this is a really, really sad case. There is nobody uh, in this world who is more beat up, uh, broken down, and sad about Sayla's death um, than uh, Alexis and Laura Berry. If convicted, Lori and Alexis each face a maximum of 60 years in prison. They will appear in court on July 9th. The man who shot by deputies yesterday during a standoff in Marquette County is expected to survive. He has been identified as 44 year old James Carlson. Deputies say his mother called police yesterday saying he was pointing a gun at her. A standoff ensued eventually leading to deputies entering the home and shooting him. He was taken to the hospital with life threatening injuries, but we are told tonight he is expected to survive. The Beloit School District employee arrested on suspicion of child pornography possession is being held on a $20,000 signature bond. Aaron Weber was arrested Friday. The school district of Beloit says he's been working for over 20 years in elementary schools throughout the district. If convicted, he could face up to 50 years in prison. Looking over the west side of Madison right now, sunshine looks pretty nice out there above our news Street now studios. Things have cleared up from this afternoon where a few storms rolled through our area. Let's check your first alert forecast now. Here's Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti. Gary? Yeah, those storms came through with some hail for a few of our viewers and uh, some lightning and heavy rain, but now things have really cleared out. You can see that patch of clouds that developed into powerful thunderstorms just south of Madison. They moved over Lake Michigan and now much of southern Wisconsin is free of precipitation. Uh, in fact, as we take a look at Doppler track, all of southern Wisconsin really has cleared out from the precipitation. It's possible a couple of those cumulus clouds could still pop up into an isolated shower or thunderstorm over the next hour or two, but after that, uh, the skies will clear out pretty nicely. High temperatures so far have been around 80 degrees, but some areas have cooled off since then because of the rain, especially in areas closer to Lake Michigan, 78 right now in Milwaukee, 75 in Waukesha, whereas out to the west, temperatures are in the middle 80s, and they've been there all afternoon. But of our morning, temperatures will only drop into the lower 60s. The skies clear out. Look for a partly sunny and warm day tomorrow with a high of 84. That's your News 3 Now First Alert forecast. City of Madison reminding anyone who experiences any type of flooding this summer to report it to them. This picture, the result of yesterday's heavy rainstorms that moved through. This is Acewood Boulevard next to LVM Elementary. 
city has a link on their website where you can make those reports. A 60-mile journey is ending at the state capitol as public education supporters make a final push for more K-12 funding. Rose Schmidt joins us live from the state capitol to explain what they're asking for. Rose? Yes, with the full assembly expected to pass the budget tonight, public education supporters are asking lawmakers to, quote, do the right thing and approve more money through K-12 through education funding. Those groups marched up to the state capitol this afternoon, ending a six, after walking a 60 miles from Palmyra to Madison over the course of several days. They say the $500 million K-12 through funding increase the state's budget committee approved does not go far enough for children across the state. The Republican-written plan has $900 million less in K-12 through funding than Governor Evers wanted. Parents and educators are asking schools to be funded to two-thirds of their total costs and a higher increase in special ed funding, among other things. While we started out with a lot of hope because we thought we were going to have $1.4 billion reinvested in our schools, after it went through the Joint Finance Committee, it came out $900 million short. But let's take a look and say, why, if you're on the other side of the aisle, why couldn't you vote for this budget? This has the same increase in education funding that Governor Evers requested when he was DPI superintendent. Republican lawmakers have said Evers' plan spends too much and they call their own plan a pro-kid budget. GOP Senator Luther Olson has said this is the best the state can do for K-12 funding and is urging Evers to sign their proposal. Governor Evers said in a statement that it's not too late for Republicans to, quote, put politics aside and do the right thing for educators, students, and schools. Now the state assembly is expected to vote on that budget tonight. That would clear the way for the Senate to take it up tomorrow. Rose Schmidt reporting live at the Capitol. Rose, thank you. Six people are dead, including four children in a house fire. This was in Pickerel, Wisconsin, in Langlade County, in the farther north part of, far northern part of the state. The children range in ages from 10 months to seven years. That's according to the Langlade County coroner. Eight people were in the home when that fire started early this morning. Two people did manage to escape. The fire is believed to have started on the lower level and worked its way upward. Right now, there is no reason to believe there was any foul play. The reward to find the killer of a Racine police officer has now been increased to more than $78,000. A masked gunman shot and killed Officer John Hetland early last week. Hetland was attempting to intervene during an armed robbery at Teaser's Bar. The suspect fled the scene. Officer Hetland, a 24-year veteran of the department, funeral services with full police honors will be held tomorrow. Despite a bit of rain interfering with the schedule, the Janesville Grand Prix has returned to downtown Janesville for the second straight year. The event is expected to bring close to 5,000 visitors to the city. Rock County reporter Adam Duxter joins us live from downtown for what this means for the local economy. Adam? Well, Eric and Charlotte, the weather was a little bit of a factor earlier, but didn't stop and still isn't stopping thousands of people from making their way to downtown Janesville. With the event still only in its second year, something people around here hopes continues to grow. Riders from all over Illinois, Michigan, Indiana coming to Janesville today to compete in something that didn't even exist two years ago. Year two, the crowd is up already, prize money's up already. Paul Murphy is co-chair of the Janesville Grand Prix and said the event is drawing exposure to the city's downtown. It's energizing the community. The hospitality industry feels a big uptick. You know, the bar and restaurant down here. A downtown that has seen its fair share of changes just recently. Now getting a chance to show them off and make some sales along the way. Events like this are so important for downtown merchants. They may not have had an opportunity to bring thousands of people to their doorstep before. With businesses bringing their product out of the store right on the streets just for today. We certainly see it as an opportunity. It, it it's, uh, increases exposure. We'll do extra business today in a big way. Murphy says the support in just the event's second year is a sign of things to come. The crowd this early in the day is an indication of how much support we're getting from the community. In between the pre last year, they got Janesville. And it's estimated that about 5,000 people will make their way to downtown Janesville today, which I'm told is going to bring about a quarter million dollars.
revenue to the downtown area. And well, the race's co-chairs hope this event continues to grow in the future. They say it's not a bad start for a one-day event that's only two years old. Adam Duxter in Janesville. Adam, thank you. Still ahead tonight, a longtime Sun Prairie bar and restaurant is forced to close, unable to meet health department standards. Plus, a day to remember the dangers of lightning as we get into the heart of this year's severe weather season. Stay with us. Today will always be in my heart as this uh, beautiful memory. And you know, when there's challenges and difficulties, not that there'll be many here, but when there's challenges and difficulties, you pull out moments like this from your heart, right? Because these are our signposts of grace that um, remind us of what the point of all of this is. That's the new bishop at his installation today, Donald Hying, officially becoming the fifth bishop in the history of the Madison Diocese in a mass today. This was at St. Maria Goretti on the west side. The Marquette alum grew up in New Berlin, but has plenty of family who still live in the diocese. He succeeds the late Robert Morlino, who passed away late last year. A popular bar and restaurant in Sun Prairie is now closed. Public health officials say they were unable to meet proper health standards. Public Health of Madison and Dane County say the owner of McGovern's Club and Restaurant was given the option to keep the bar open but declined. According to the restaurant's website, McGovern's opened in 1935 as a bar named Woody's. It is Lightning Safety Awareness Day here in Wisconsin. A time to remember the dangers that lightning can present to life and property. Meteorologist Dave Caulfield joins us now with what you need to always keep in mind, Dave. Well, Eric and Charlotte, lightning is often a severe weather threat that gets overlooked. We're so concerned with tornadoes and heavy rain that sometimes we forget just how deadly lightning strikes can be. On average, nearly 50 people in the United States die every year from lightning strikes, and the majority of deaths occur to people who had been enjoying outdoor leisure activities. The key to being safe in a thunderstorm is to get to a safe place before the lightning threat occurs. Being clear about that ahead of time, knowing when you will take personal responsibility and seek shelter. McClellan says if thunderstorms are in the forecast, you should map out a severe weather plan, including closest safe shelters before you head out to the links or the game. No place outside is safe from lightning strikes, but if you are caught outside, get off of elevated areas like hills or peaks, get away from bodies of water and objects that conduct electricity and don't use a rocky overhang or tree for shelter. When you are inside, remember to stay off pieces of equipment like computers that put you in contact with electricity. Avoid plumbing, including sinks, baths and faucets and stay away from windows and doors at least 
30 minutes until after you hear that last sound of thunder. If I had a dollar for every time I've texted Gary at a Little League game or something and <laughs> right? said, what's the reminder again? How yeah. far do you have mm -hmm. to count all that? I'd be a rich man, but uh, it is an important thing to remember Absolutely. when you're outdoors during the summer. Dave, thank you. When we come back, we'll see if we can expect any more storms tonight or this week ahead of a dramatic warm-up this weekend. Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti will have the details. And coming up in sports, University Ridge getting its work in this week, hosting another significant golf event. Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti joins us with a look at our forecast, and you can go on and on and on about the lightning. Yeah, you know, I'm glad Dave did that story because what people don't realize is those who are struck by lightning, you know, the chances of getting struck by lightning mm -hmm. are small, but people who are struck by lightning usually have some kind of physical condition that lasts for the rest of their life because if you figure it's a mm -hmm. big jolt of electricity right. and heat to go through your body, it can do strange things. You know, you people talking have been about hearing. losing your hearing, mm -hmm. uh, have ringing in your ears, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, and, and even worse, you know, some people, you know, have concussions or yeah. headaches and, you know, so you just don't want to Don't mess. take your chances. People come in out of the rain, but they don't come in out of the lightning. Come in out of the lightning, that's what we tell people. Well, fortunately, our lightning is over with. We had a little cluster of thunderstorms that blew up right over Monroe and Janesville and then raced eastward out into Lake Michigan. And you can see how quickly the skies cleared right behind that cluster that popped up right there. There are a few cumulus clouds still up here. Possible that an isolated shower or thunderstorm could yet develop yet this evening. Nothing to that extent. But uh, later on tonight, I think uh, skies will clear out and that'll pretty much be it as far as any kind of chance for rain. Most of the showers and storms now are on the other side of Lake Michigan, and there's really nothing upstream from us. These showers and storms will fizzle out after sunset, but they're mainly staying up to the north. Now, there is a severe weather threat on Thursday. Tomorrow should be dry. Thursday, the next batch of showers and storms moves in a marginal risk of severe thunderstorms, according to the Storm Prediction Center. But that's as increasing heat and humidity start to build in our direction. Uh, very little rain expected through Thursday, and then 
as we head through next week, you can see the rainfall totals tick up gradually day by day as even as we go through uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, the 4th of July holiday, and then as we get toward the end of the week. So over that whole time period, over the next 10 days, we could be looking at another one to two inches of rain. Some areas will pick up more than that in a heavier thunderstorm, but that'll be the exception rather than the rule. The European computer model has much less, uh, generally around an inch or less through southern Wisconsin, which would be good news. Live view from the WISC SkyCam, you can see those cumulus clouds. They don't have much vertical development with it, so I don't think that we're going to see much in the way of uh, shower or thunderstorm activity. High temperature so far today is 80, and that's where our current temperature is. The air is calm. The dew point temperature has dropped to 61 as the air dries out a little bit after these showers and storms rolled through. They moved through southern Wisconsin, missed out on northern Illinois, so that's why temperatures are a little bit warmer there. But the dew point temperatures definitely are dropping to the west into the 50s, but that'll be a temporary drop because we'll see the heat and humidity build again as we head toward the latter part of the week. The jet stream right now is flattened out, uh, bringing in mild Pacific air, but notice how it again switches to a more southwesterly direction. So what will happen is this cold front that generated the showers and storms uh, will become stationary. It already has across parts of Kansas, uh, Nebraska into northern Kansas, and then eventually will start working northward as a warm front. And south of that front, temperatures are in the upper 80s and lower 90s. Dew point temperatures are approaching the 70 degree mark as far north as Kansas City. So we'll see the heat and humidity build with high temperatures around 90 by the weekend. Overnight, look for some mostly clear skies, uh, very mild, low temperature dropping to 63. Tomorrow, partly sunny and warm. Humidity level is not too bad, uh, high temperature at 84. But on future track, you can see uh, skies clearing out overnight, low temperatures in the lower 60s, plenty of sunshine for tomorrow, high temperatures in the mid 80s. Now tomorrow night, we start to see some clouds move in. It's possible we could see a shower or thunderstorm late at night, low temperatures staying in the upper 60s, then some scattered shower and thunderstorm chances on Thursday, high temperatures low to mid 80s. But again, that's as the humidity levels start to increase. As you look at that 7 to 10 day forecast, that leads to high temperatures around 90. We have alert days in the forecast for Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Nighttime low temperatures staying around 70 degrees. There'll be some thunderstorm chances, but also plenty of rain-free hours as well. Some of the legends of the Wisconsin Badgers sports have their annual reunion at University Ridge today. That story is coming up in sports.
Last weekend, it was the American Family Insurance Championship. Today, University Ridge hosted another significant golf event, the 18th annual Legends of Wisconsin Classic. Some of the big names in Wisconsin athletics are there for their annual reunion and to thank Badger Athletics boosters, star-studded group from Barry Alvarez, Pat Richter, to Joe Thomas and Brian Butch, and head football coach Paul Chris was hanging out. And one of the former Badgers there is Rams offensive lineman Rob Havenstein. While his Wisconsin teammate James White won the Super Bowl, Havenstein was on the wrong side with the Rams. Still, he says it was a great experience. It was awesome. It was, I mean, obviously, it's a dream for everyone who's, who's played professional ball, and um, you know, it didn't it didn't end the way we wanted. But you know, we're uh, you know, I think it's just made our team uh, you know a little more hungry, a little more motivated, a little more urgent to get uh, you know to get things corrected that we need to be that need to be corrected. So Havenstein, who spent a lot of time in Wisconsin in his college days, is now a California guy in his third season in Los Angeles. Our Melissa Kim asked the question that needed to be asked. Culver's or in and out Oh, Culver's for sure. in and outs good, but uh, no cheese curds. And Kit Kat Swirl, too, of course. The Bucks cleaned up at the NBA Awards last night. Mike Budenholzer, Coach of the Year. John Horst, Executive of the Year. And, of course, Giannis Antetokounmpo, the NBA's most valuable player. Giannis gave an emotional acceptance speech. Then he gave Bucks fans something they really wanted to hear. At the end of the day, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. Uh, my goal is to win a championship. Um, as my dad told me, you know, always want more, but never be greedy. Uh, my goal is to win a championship, and we're going to do whatever it takes to make that happen. Another first for forward Wisconsin FC. Tonight is the first time a major league soccer team plays a game in Madison ever. Minnesota United is in town for a friendly against the Flamingos at 7. We'll have highlights of the match on News 3 now tonight at 10. Women's World Cup round of 16. Netherlands and Japan tied at 1 in the 90th minute. Is this a handball in the box? Uh, the referee says it is and awards a penalty kick to the Netherlands. Lieke Martens gets it and converts it. Netherlands 2, Japan 1. Here's the schedule for the quarterfinals Thursday. Norway against England. Friday, it's the United States and France at 2. Two quarterfinals are on Saturday. Italy and the Netherlands and Germany and Sweden. The Brewers begin an interleague series with the Seattle Mariners tonight at Miller Park just after 7. They sign their first round draft pick, Ethan Small, today. Madison Mallard's now 20 and 8 to start the season. They beat the Green Bay Booyah in game one of the doubleheader in Nash Wabanon 13 4 this afternoon. Game two starts in about 10 minutes. And the Michigan Wolverines can clinch the College Baseball World Series for the first time since 1962 tonight if they beat Vanderbilt in the second game of the best of three series in Omaha. Former Janesville Craig star Jack Blomgren is a big part of that Michigan team. Last night, Blomgren had three. He hits in Michigan's 7-4 win. He is the starting shortstop for Michigan. He won a state title with Craig in 19, uh, 2015. And tonight, he could become a part of an NCAA champion. They've had some great players in Janesville, and he's another one. He's only a sophomore. He's second team All-Big Ten this year. It's great to see Big Ten uh, making a yeah. statement in baseball. Got to win right? one more. And from the North. I agree with you on the Kit Kat swirl. Oh. Yeah, I know. You got me thinking. You guys were eating that in the newsroom last night, no, right? It's great. It's great. You're making me hungry now. <laughs> it's almost dinner time, Gary. We need a final check of the forecast first. Well, the rain's over with, uh, pushed off to the east. Uh, nothing really upstream, so should be dry for the rest of tonight and tomorrow. Uh, temperatures right now right around 80 degrees, a little cooler to the east where the clouds are still clearing. Otherwise, alert days in the forecast, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, highs around 90. Nighttime low temperatures around 70. Heat index values between about... 93 and 98 degrees. There'll be some thunderstorm chances, best chances probably eh, maybe Tuesday and Wednesday, hopefully the 4th of July, mainly dry. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. We'll see you back here at 10.